Hello, welcome to Coriol, where we are talking all things Grenache. Uh, my name's Peter Lloyd, and this is... My name is Duncan Lloyd, and uh, why make you here at Coriol? So Grenache is one of those varieties that has um, been susceptible to the vagaries of fashion over the last 20, 30, 40 years. It went from being the, the most unpopular variety when I was a kid, um, so much so that if, if your parents grew it, um, you were bullied at school. Um, <laughs> It was so desperately unpopular. Well, I think the year I was born was the great um, Grenache vine pool. 86. Well, that's why that wine there exists, but more on that later. Um, I guess the point is that, you know, like lots of industries, wine is a fashion industry. And in 1986, it was the pits. No one cared about it and everybody wanted it gone. Whereas now uh, it is the most popular variety most popular variety, the, the, the variety that um, gains the, probably the most attention in McLaren Vale and also the variety that commands the highest price per ton. Uh, there's still a far more amount of, a far higher amount of um, Shiraz and Cabernet grown in McLaren Vale, but Grenache is certainly on trend. Typically when people think about Grenache, they'll think about a red wine, but I guess we're gonna run through a few wines here and Grenache, like lots of other varieties, actually does exist in essentially three forms. So Grenache Blanc, Grenache Gris and Grenache Noir. There's also another mutation called Hairy Grenache. Oh, sounds delicious. The leaves are exceptionally hairy. Right. Well, there we go. You learn something every day. Yep. So yeah, while most of uh, the historic plantings in McLaren Vale and, and in Australia would be to Grenache Noir, in more recent times there have been increasing plantings of um, Grenache Blanc and Grenache Gris. So the first two wines we're looking at today are based around the Grenache Blanc and Grenache Gris. The reason we chose to plant these varieties was we were, we'd been working with Picpoul, uh, so quite a high acid white variety from the south of France. And we were looking to create a wine of richness and fullness and texture, both for our Coriol brand and our June brand. So we planted uh, Grenache Blanc, uh, Grenache Gris, and these two are the result. It's been a five, six, seven, eight year process, I guess, to get where we are now. But both of these wines, um, in slightly different ways, uh, demonstrate richness and fullness and, and depth of flavour, which is what we're looking for. So the first uh, wine we're looking at is the 2022 Sandalwood Grenache Gris Pickball. So this is a co-ferment so these two varieties were picked together and processed together and fermented together we really love that grenache gris gives a more richness and, and texture where the pig pool gives that beautiful acidity and backbone to the wine uh, so this was all uh, aged in old french hogsheads for about hogsheads are barrels barrels yes literally the head of a hog that would so, be gross yes. 300 litre uh barrels. Yeah, so the resultant wine is really interesting and diverse and different to what we typically might have seen here previously in McLaren Vale. This is from our Sandalwood Vineyard, which is in the foothills of McLaren Flat, so our coolest site, latest ripening. This is grown on, on quite a steep slope, very rocky, free-draining soil. We quite like the influence that soil has on, on, on these white varieties. As Duncan mentioned, these two varieties are grown side by side, co-fermented. Much the same process happens here with our Grenache Blanc, uh, dominant wine. This is from our Blewett Springs vineyard, uh, which we call the Desert Sands vineyard because of its soil is sand, essentially sand over yellow clay. So this we planted seven or eight years ago now, Grenache Blanc and a small amount of Grenache Gris and a small amount of another variety from the South of France called Claret. This 21 was probably the first time we really got what we were looking for in terms of richness and, and texture and intensity. Both very interesting wines, a little bit more uh, bottle development on the 21, the June Elbeda, showing a bit more waxy characters coming through. But yeah, I mean, looking at that sandalwood, it's got quite uh, delicious baked pears and vanilla spice on the nose, and it seems quite pretty and delicate, but then it just has this beautiful richness and texture on the palate, so it's really, um, really fills out in the middle of the palate, so it really makes a really interesting wine to... And the Elbeda really feels like you've just been lobbed into Provence or somewhere at the bottom of the Rhone Valley there. You get all these beautiful smells of peaches and honey, nougat, cooking spice. So it's quite a, a lovely rich array of flavours. Both of these wines are probably slightly softer in terms of acidity than we're, than we're typically used to with a lot of Australian white wines. But their versatility amongst a range of foods are certainly there. They can handle richer flavours and work well with strong 
strong cheeses, wash rind cheeses, for example, and could also handle sort of lighter game. Two lovely examples of, of uh, whites from Grenache Blanc and Grenache Gris. And um, as I mentioned earlier, something that will become a, you know, well, is a part of our future to come. So we'll look at a couple of Grenache now. Again, we're going to look at another one from our June vineyard. As the crow flies only 10 kilometres from here, where this wine comes from. But as I mentioned earlier, sandy soil, sand on clay, typically uh, gives us slightly lighter, softer styles of, of Grenache. And then the estate, sh estate Grenache here, which is from three small bush vine vineyards on the estate, each about half an acre in size. And the estate Grenache is a blend of those three those three vineyards. Typically we would find here the soils are a brown earth on limestone and at the top of the hill ironstone and that typically results in in wines of much more structure, uh, much more intensity and just a more savoury expression than we'd get from our, our Blue Springs vineyard. Instantly pouring them out you see a difference in the colour so off these sandier soils it's generally going to be a slightly lighter colour but quite quite pretty in the glass and leaps out ar aromatically. A lot of that classic kind of raspberry and lavender, uh, white pepper, really intensely aromatic and quite vibrant on the nose. Here's the noise maintenance man leaving for the afternoon. Whereas the Coriolis Estate Grenache, particularly just straight out of the bottle, is just a little bit more flavour and it probably looks a bit more closed initially, but you see a bit more earth and spice and uh, extra layer of complexity on the nose there, but will really benefit with a bit of time in the glass. Both wines are quite similarly handled. Um, in, in the winery and it's something we're working with a lot in the winery and um, at the moment with our Grenache. We generally will have a few ferments with a, a small percent of whole bunch in there, really just to accentuate some of that beautiful vibrancy and, and aromatic lift. But yeah, really then it's about working with the, the tannin profile and keeping these wines that are, are quite delicate in a way. So really just trying to harness that delicacy and, and keep, the, keep the freshness and vibrancy. So two quite different wines there and that's that's the reason that they both exist and that's the nice thing Grenache is beautiful uh, or does a beautiful job I should say of um, of showing its sight people would term you know the, the that is, is, has been a great expression of terroir and we we really find we really find that to be the case with with Grenache the June is just a lot more open instantly a bit more ethereal on the palate probably some sort of sweeter fruits through the mid palate and reasonably soft in its tannin profile um, where again, yeah, the, the Coriol Grenache yeah, has a bit more depth of flavour, but does have a bit more structure and, and tannin, which is very typical of, of our site here at Coriol, and something not to shy away from, and, and really it's just about harnessing that and finding the right balance in, in these wines. I'll have a look now at our Stonewall Grenache. We'll pour this alongside the Coriol. So this is, I mentioned earlier, we have three small vineyards here. And you wouldn't believe it, but the Stonewall Grenache is from our Stonewall Vineyard. This is a beautiful iron stone wall built probably around 1860 at the bottom of our property. And we have a, Gren a Grenache Vineyard just to the north. Over the last you know, four or five years, this has really shown itself to be the premium site, which is interesting. It's at the bottom of the hill. And we just typically find lovely balance and a beautiful array of flavours in this wine, which probably elevates it slightly above the other two vineyards. Yeah, it, to me, it typically just shows great power, but a little bit more delicacy, a bit more of those ethereal notes uh, coming through on the palate. Lovely lift and fragrance, again, back to a lot of those provincial herbs and lavenders and... I love provincial herbs. Provincial herbs, mm. yeah. Well, it's sort of, sort of like the, the garden bed uh, just next to us. But yeah, it does have a lovely, sweet, herby character and very strong aromas of black tea, like fragrant black salon tea is always a character that we see in this vineyard that, like Duncan mentioned earlier, it's probably slightly lighter than the Estate Grenache, but just has that next array of intensity of flavor, which makes it stand out. So that's a very small bottling of maybe two barrels, I think. So what's yeah. that, 50 dozen? Yeah, it's the reason we keep that one aside. Yeah, great wine to get into a big glass and really let it open up. It's worth just touching briefly on Terre de Fer, which is a Grenache Shiraz. This Grenache is from a Grenache vineyard at the top of the hill that I mentioned earlier is on ironstone and creates quite a concentrated style of Grenache, but on its own can, the tannins can be a little obtuse. So what we've started doing the last couple of years is, is co-fermenting this with a, a parcel of Shiraz from our Petit Gala vineyard, which is again at the top of the hill. 
and just results in a really lovely, quite sturdy wine, but then quite polished and, and glossy and full bodied. And so the, I think really it just shows that Grenache can bring such a beautiful, a beautiful intensity to a, to a blend. It's really about finding great balance between these two varieties. And so we handpick the Grenache and throw that straight in the fermenter as whole bunches and then um, crush the Shiraz over the top. And so get some of that lift and really vibrancy from the whole, bunches, whole bunch maceration from the Grenache and some really interesting characters coming through. Again, that black tea and, and spice and charcuterie, but then all this sort of red lolly character coming through as well. And, and on a cold lolly. day like today, it's just beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a rich statement, but yeah, certainly a better wine than, than either of the two components on its own from this vintage. Yeah, and again, you've got all that, that sort of power and, and fruit from the Shiraz, but uh, I guess the Grenache just helps to kind of fill out that mid palate. So you again have that slightly more ethereal feel through the palate and lots of lovely sweet fruit flavors coming through. Quite a long, persistent finish. So fantastic tannins on that one. Yeah, it really gives it a lot of drive and length. And now uh, we're looking at our Prudence. So Prudence is named after Anne Prudence Wilson, who is one of the owners of Coriel and responsible for the beautiful gardens that any visitor to Coriel would have seen. And this wine started its life in 1986 when Duncan was born, and that was the year of the vine pool. So that was when people were paid to pull Grenache out. And it's a kind of a strange thing to think about because on one hand, we lost this beautiful bit of history that was probably at that point 70 or 80 years old. But on the other hand, it made way for things like Sangiovese, which really have helped us to establish our position in the Australian market. So it's, uh, I guess, bittersweet in some ways that we lost that vineyard. And the preceding years, so probably from 83, 4, 5 and 6, there was Grenache left on the vine each year. You just couldn't, it was so unpopular. And so therefore you have to look at different things to do. So there were rosés made from Grenache. There was lots of blends made. And then this wine here. So this would have been put down as a fortified wine that would have been, would have been picked very late, uh, which Grenache is great at accumulating alcohol. Um, so it would have been picked very ripe. And then it would have been, the fermentation would have started and been arrested at some point with the addition of brandy. And then it would have sat in barrels or it did sit in barrels for 30 plus years. And yeah, we've been sort of sitting around in the bottom of the cellar occasionally over the years, having a bit of a look at it and a, a taste here and now, now and again. But yeah, we finally decided to get some of it into bottle and, and get it out through our cellar door. So quite an interesting wine with lots of huge amount of complexity of flavour. There's lots of toffee and treacle and dried fruits and pan forte and quince paste and loads of aromatic spice. It's a really long wine on the palate, as you'd imagine, with all of that sugar and alcohol. And then you get those rancio characters. So this is obviously a, an oxidized style, being a tawny. Um, so it sort of reaches this point where it, it finds a stability within itself and becomes a really full and rich and intense style of wine. So certainly not to be consumed in vast quantities, but something to sip at the end of a meal with, with cheese or, or the right dessert works exceptionally well. Yeah, I think I could just sit at the end of a meal and, and smell a glass of this wine. It's just, You don't just really so need much. to drink it. You no. can just smell it and it gives <laughs> you. So much complexity and all, an array of flavors coming through. It's a good so. wine for those people that say they struggle to be able to describe or find descriptors in a wine because you put your nose in this and you just, every time there's a different smell whether it's butterscotch yeah. or if it's caramel whether it's dried apricot whether it's whatever it is it yeah, just keeps on giving sort um, of citrus and boiled orange rind and mandarin coming through now so it's certainly a wine that exists because of some problems or <laughs> or unpopularity um, but we're very grateful <laughs> for it now there's not a lot of it but but it's uh, yeah a lovely style so worth having a look so that's a bit of an overview of Grenache there's quite a lot of wines there none of these are made in in, in big quantities whatsoever. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, we, we, the reason there are quite a lot of different wines is because each vineyard is, is, is really capable of, of, of showing its own unique characters um, with Grenache, yeah, which is quite exciting. So yeah, we've probably learned some lessons over the last 40 years with Grenache. So we might be slightly more conservative in our approach in terms of planting, because I guess we've been burnt before. <laughs> but no, we, we certainly are quite excited about the variety and um, encourage you to track down some or all of these wines and check them out. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Cheers. Cheers.